Welcome to everybody. You know, pleasure to be here. Also, just a really quick shout out to Walter Lotte and the rest of the team at Global PropTech Online for hosting us and, and setting up such a great series of talks today. Great, we have the full team. So just to give you a brief run of the show, I'm gonna give you a quick intro on myself, intro into what amazing panelists we have, uh, set the stage with a short talk about sustainability, and then we're gonna move into the panel discussion. We will reserve sort of you know, 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So please be ready to give the panelists a hard time. Not me, just them, please. Um, oh. So look, quick, 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 quick introduction on myself. So I'm Paolo. I have the pleasure of moderating the panel today. With the discussion is going to focus on prop tech and sustainability. It's going to be the hype versus reality, the trends for 2022 and any hurdles that we need to overcome. So quickly, by background, I'm a banker, M&A person by, by trade. I had a fintech startup in Tanzania. I'm an active uh, mentor and advisor to social impact startups. I'm a venture partner for Tidal Impact. And more importantly, I'm part of the Reach UK team, which I'm now embarrassingly going to plug. So we are a growth program for tech companies that are scaling into real estate. We're backed by Second Century Ventures and a national association of realtors in the US and a partner among service to property mark in the UK. And we also have 100 plus bilateral relationships uh, with associations across the world. We just graduated our first cohort, so I do want to take this opportunity to say, look, we've opened applications for the next batch kicking off in March. If you know any really cool startups that want to go into hyper growth in the UK, send them our way. I'm on LinkedIn, and we have a meet and greet this Thursday at 2 p.m. GMT. So moving on to the better people, uh, I'm going to kick off with Alex as just a really brief intro. So uh, and we do have an amazing panel. So Alex is a director of innovation at JLL. So he advises JLL's clients on the technological and systemic disruption facing the property industry with a specific focus on clients, well, basically helping clients future proof portfolios and buildings for future market needs. He has a personal goal to embed sustainability into real estate decision making. Um, and the proof in the pudding is that he's an active board member of the UK PropTech Association. He's the ex head of sustainability at JLL UK and was previously at Naveen. Uh, moving on to the second, Alex, Alex evoked. Uh, he, you know, big welcome. He's a senior innovation manager at Eon Innovation. He previously worked with startups as an early tech investor in the Energy Innovation Hub. And in his role at Eon Innovation, he's driving the energy transformation by enabling corporate startup partnerships and building new ventures in the sector of modern living. Absolute pleasure to introduce Ami Kotecha. Ami is the co-founder and head of venture investments at Amro Partners. So all the startups are now super keen, uh, which is a London-based property investment and development firm. But most importantly, and perhaps most interestingly, they invest in residential real estate and transformational technology to create inclusive connected communities and have committed to becoming a net zero carbon developer and investor by 2030. Uh, AMI is also spending money left, right and center. They are an active investor. They recently invested in Proportunity and Coajutes. They're on track to make 10 investments in the first 12 months of venture investing. So that is extremely, extremely impressive. Last but not least, uh, Bridget Wilkins, who also wins the award for longest job title. Uh, <laughs> Bridget is the head of digital citizen engagement at the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities for the UK government, um, which is half my speech now. As a head of digital citizen engagement, you know, Bridget's passion lies in using digital technology to foster diversity and inclusivity across communities and drive the acceleration of prop tech across the development and planning industry. She was also previously director of community engagement at Built ID, sat on the CBRE UK Innovation Board and is a founding member of the Urban Land Institute UK Tech Forum. So before we do kick off with the question, I just wanted to just take well, two or three minutes to quickly run through some views on sustainability to sort of set, you know, fertilize the soil, so to speak. Well, that sounds terrible, but you know what I mean. Uh, so sustainability, that was a bad one. As mentioned, the panelists will get better interest themselves before we get to going and to clarify matters. And please don't send me any hate email. Sustainability is not just about going green. Right. So as you can tell from the panel members, this is a wide topic, right? This touches upon all facets of life. And it's also not just ESG for, for people who think that's the case. So the best description I found, which I think is a useful one, is sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Sustainability is about the relationship between a company and the environment. So the obvious question is, why care about it? And is it a hype? So I'm going, to, I'm going to touch on some, some useful data points. But speaking on behalf of the Reach UK team, um, we would definitely say there's no hype when it comes to the problems we're facing, both at the local and global scale. 
that doesn't mean that there isn't any hype when we look at the solutions and their abilities to bring around mass impact, right? So certain parts of the market are most definitely hot to say the least, and there is an amount of greenwashing taking place. So why should we in prop tech or real estate care and what really is the opportunity? Well, look, real estate sector consumes about 40% of global energy annually. Buildings is 20% of that, well, half of that, so 20%. And 40% is, comes from raw material usage, right? So 37% of total carbon emissions in the UK just come from heating, right? So this is, this is massive from every single perspective. And the good news, uh, as far as that is good news, is that you know, tech providers, asset owners, and investors are starting to come around. So 94% of owners believe that their buildings are more valuable after conducting green retrofitting renovation projects. 73% of investors say that green strategies drive Higher occupancy, higher rents, higher tenant retention, and overall higher value. Same amount again for green certifications. And from the JLL report, you know, decarbonizing the built environment, which by the way is highly recommended reading, and not just because Alex is on the panel, tech is a top investment priority for occupiers. So, you know, 84% of occupiers agree that digital solutions will be critical in achieving sustainability. So the owners are interested. We know there's a problem, but how big is the opportunity? So in the UK, two thirds of the buildings that exist today will still be standing in 2050. Since buildings account for as much as 70% of a carbon city's emissions, well, you know, the opportunity for retrofitting is absolutely massive, right? So to give you a quote, we know 29 million houses need retrofitting by 2050. That's 1.8 homes per minute, according to the Committee on Climate Change. So during the length of this panel, that means 100 homes should have been retrofitted. Based on how long it takes me to find a plumber for my bathroom, I can tell you this is not going to happen without some tech solutions, at least not in the UK. Um, and this is also global, right? So going global, according to World Green Building Council, in order to comply with the Paris Climate Agreement, all new developments must be carbon neutral by 2030. And by 2050, all buildings will need to be carbon neutral. I mean, if you really think about that on the scale of the world, that is absolutely well, insane. So we have intent, we have a big opportunity. What about the money, right? So in 2019, the UK government pledged to spend about 4 billion on decarbonizing social housing and public real estate. Uh, good news, bad news. They only spent 3% of that money since. So uh, not, not, not great, but there's a lot of money left to spend. And so for startups that are focusing on that area, I'd highly recommend you check out the government grants portal. Um, but also the lending banks, right? So Lloyds Bank has committed $2 billion to clean growth finance. HSBC has committed to provide $100 billion in sustainable financing and investment by 2025, right? As long as you tell them it's a green asset, they'll throw money at you. And then we have VCs, right? So we have uh, investors who are targeting sustainable solutions, you know, like AMRO, but also 2150, Future Energy Ventures, Tidal Impact, and the like. So I think the, the base is all there, but not actually throwing it back to the panel. Um, so question for all of you, we'll, we'll take it in turn. Alex, I think we'll kick off with you, but could you just give a better intro than I gave on you if you'd like to, and then could we kick off your views on sustainability? So is it just a hype of unproven technologies competing for capital with unclear impact, or is it here to stay and will it become a fundamental part of real estate and prop tech moving forwards? Yeah, hi, and thanks for inviting me. I think you did a pretty good job so um, of introducing me. I guess I would just say a yeah, former sustainability professional um, now sort of in innovation and tech. So this is uh, this is great for me. It's bringing my two worlds together. Um, and it's great to see that the market is now bringing those two worlds together. And I suppose in answer to your question, and, and I suppose also in terms of reflecting on kind of where we are and where we've been, you know, certainly, you know, when I started out, um, having to sort of bang down doors to try and get in to speak to decision makers to talk about sustainability. Um, we're not, you know, now we're their favorite people and we're invited in. So <laughs> it's a complete shift in the way that the industry is, is approaching and wants to talk about sustainability. And I think to some of the numbers that you've quoted, you know, you know, for so for so much of my career, it was really challenging to get any sort of budget to spend on sustainability. I think now it's proven that the market is there and it's going to grow. Uh, the money's there and it's going to grow. Um, so they're two very important considerations. Um, and I think that that just gives rise to, you know, what we're already seeing and what we're going to see more of, which is a lot of um, very clever people trying to solve some very ch hard challenges. I think an unintended consequence and maybe this is what you're alluding to is that obviously where there's a great market and a great a lot of opportunity yes there can perhaps be create some confusion and also and that's certainly true generally in prop tech at the moment i mean speak to a lot of clients 
um, you know, their biggest concern is I don't know which one of the solutions is best to pick. Um, and I think in terms of sustainability, you know, there is a potential that we're going to see quite a lot of solutions come into the space, um, whether they've got good intentions or not, but actually not necessarily delivering on the outcomes that, that we need to deliver. And I think that's where regulation and or industry body, you know, standards, and we're already starting to see them emerge, are going to have to play a role in creating transparency um, in term, and, rig, and some rigor around are we actually delivering against the goals that, that were stated. And I suppose, you know, just the, the, the message to the tech community and probably to the VCs supporting them is, you know, when when sort of both pitching your solutions, measuring the, the impact of those solutions, and then obviously when you're looking to invest in, in such tech companies, it's just having that kind of eye to rigor around, you know, this is this is this is going to be measured very with a forensic kind of level of, of um, you know, tool set. So um, we, we need to make sure it stacks up. And I think that's just something that's changed certainly from when I was, you know, very much involved in sustainability in the early years and probably until very recently, a lot of the solutions were sort of put in under the, you know, the guise of we think it will hit, you know, 20% and then it maybe tri triples along around five or six and, and no one really, no one really cares. Um, it's not as, you know, but now that's going to change. And I think um, one of the biggest questions and I think probably the topic of the year and today, um, and we're speaking to a client, it's, it's what does a sort of, technology stack for a building look like to deliver net zero um, and it's sort of adding on all the different elements whether it's lighting whether it's hvac whether it's you know new designs whether it's operational efficiencies whether it's engaging with consumers like what are all the things that i need to add on to that stack that's going to drive that 100 percent? we don't know that yet um, we need to get there and we need to get there quite quickly um, and i think that's just you know something which we're going to look to the tech community to help us solve Awesome. Thanks a lot. Bridget, you want to you wanna go next? Thank you. Um, I completely agree. The title is very long and probably takes up half of this panel discussion, but probably just to simplify what my current role is, it's to sort of bridge the gap between government, uh, the prop tech sector and the development market in terms of uh, accelerating the adoption of prop tech platforms, particularly focused on digital citizen engagement. And I think that's a really interesting space given the conversation we're having, um, because Alex, to your point, we talk about a tech stack and what a net, net zero or sort of the best sort of most sustainable building could be. And I think we have an opportunity to, to actually look beyond our red line boundary and look at the community around these buildings, the communities in them, the communities that are there before and after these developments or refurbishments occur. Uh, and look at how we can include them in the decision-making process uh, to look at the other lens of social sustainability and wider behavioural change. Because as I'm sure we all know and have read the case studies, we can build the most sustainable building or retro sustainable building, but if no one's using it the right way because they haven't had the right uh, level of involvement in designing it and creating that space and feeling like they own that space, then there probably is um, you know, a loss there and a lost opportunity. So I think... The lens I love to bring to this conversation and, and one we're trying to push out in the wine industry is the opportunity to really shift our expectations of what communities can do uh, in line with a sustainable development agenda and how powerful communities can be both as a resident and as an occupier and as part of a transient community to inform that process of how we're delivering more sustainable solutions and maintaining them and owning them um, as a more collective uh, community along the way. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Alex Vogt, would you be happy to, to go next on your views on uh, sustainability? Sure, thank you also for your nice introduction. So not, not much to add from my side. I think um, I'm really happy to be part of this panel today because it's matching like my, uh, my pa uh, passion in real estate, but also energy sector and sustainability is basically bringing this together as well as the, the interface from corporate to startup and how you can, can leverage um, both uh, by, by collaboration using the scale, scale potential of the corporate and the tech and innovation potential of startups. And if it comes to sustainability, I think um, for me, it's kind of the next step after digitization. So the past de decade has been a lot about uh, putting out sensors, making buildings smart and so on. And now what is what uh, we have kind of the groundwork 
to build up on sustainability based propositions on that. So I think um, it is kind of the next step, but doesn't mean that the buildings are already like digitized and that the this the basics are there. So we still have to focus also on making uh, making buildings and uh, homeowners basically able to build up on sustainability. So this is, I think, the first take. And I would agree to what Bridget said about um, the human perspective and the community perspective. So um, same with, with digitization and all the tech stuff, we should never forget the humans you have who have to use it and uh, to manage it. So from, from the people living in buildings, working in offices and also the facility managers um, who use like the, the building management systems, for example, day by day, they need to have easy to use solutions. So when we deploy tech, which is making processes more complicated, which, which are not really helpful, we don't have any success in the end. So this is my message also uh, to the startups and the tech people out there. Uh, don't forget about the people involved in, into the equation. And uh, third topic we are currently working on at E.ON together with startups, but also on our own is a little bit on how to measure actually the impact and how to create a roadmap. So for example, um, there we're working with a Frankfurt based startup, it's called Right Based on Science, who are um, uh, creating like uh, calculating like an um, impact of the um, sustainability, the greenhouse gas, um, impact on the building. So that means that you can calculate the status quo and then you can derive measures and build up a roadmap what needs to be done to um, to bring real estate to carbon zero. Uh, carbon zero yeah. Awesome. So, so I get the general sense so far outside. We're waiting for Ami to talk, but so far it's no one said it's an absolute hype and God forbid the simulators will, will going to hell. So Ami, unless you want to be contrarian, but I'd be curious also on your side as as an investor, are you at least outside of just the need for sustainability tech, are you seeing any of that sort of hotness in devaluations? And I know we'll cover in a bit more detail later, but just as a premonition, where do you sit on the spectrum? Hot Thanks, Paolo. Hotness is a very important word in this panel. Um, we come back to it. So very interesting question, but the sustainability tech is all hype. Let's just go back for a minute to sustainability. And when we're talking about numbers, I think the most important number that has changed everything and is, is the mathematical probability of events. So we, we're going, I mean, let's start at the beginning. We talk at one in hundred year events when it comes to environmental impact assessments for buildings. Those one in hundred year events that we generally ticked a box on as part of a statutory uh, consultation process and planning, which Alex Eds probably knows about really well, is no longer a probability that we can rely on. So that's the biggest number in my view that's impacted the sustainability con conversation. We've gone from something being very predictable and insurable to becoming an existential threat, mm. right? So everything's, it's a game changer as far as I'm concerned. And everything that we can do therefore in terms of innovation and tech to enable getting back to a probabilistic stand from a probabilistic standpoint to a more level playing field again is everything doing in, going in the right way. And we're not there and, we, and time is running out as we know. So, um, in terms of what you said, Paolo, about what the Climate Change Committee is saying, that's also very interesting uh, from the perspective of sustainability because we can, we can talk about the amount of money and the amount of retrofits and amount of uh, you know, 260 billion pounds of, is what they think that it, it is gonna take to retrofit the resi environment. But that aside, I think the first and most important thing that tech can help us resolve is what is green. And, and that's a really important other one that we really need to resolve. So if we're going to get back to a level probabilistic state where we can all say, right, we can predict climate going forward, tech will have done a massive job there. Um, in order to get there, we need some KPIs. And one of the biggest KPIs is what is green. So be able to measure what is green, how do we report it, how do we act on it, and how, do, how much do we automate becoming green? I think that's the E part. Then going to the circularity, and I think 
that's where the whole kind of ESG conversation comes in, is that, again, when you move away from one asset, one real estate asset, in my view, to looking at the built environment sector as a whole, then you have to take into account transport, mobility, circular economy, all of those other things, uh, human connectedness, happiness. I mean, you can, you can call it so many things. And that's where I think everything that tech does to actually measure and contribute to the ESG conversation makes it really important. So, you know, big answer, I guess, to uh, your question, sustainability tech is not a fad. It's, um, it's a necessity almost if we want to meet our you know, challenges in good time as a sector. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Actually, you know, just to just pick up on that, I have a friend who who I shall keep unnamed, who works in a real estate fund, who invests in like in industrial boxes, and HSBC keeps telling him, "So is the asset green?" He has no clue if the asset is green, um, and they're literally pushing him to just say the asset is green, so that you know that they can tick the box and offer green financing. And they literally tell him, but he has no idea where to even start or how to measure how green it is. He's he's old school, old school. Um, and, and I would also say, you know, to your point about it's it's far wider if you look at mobility and the rest of this, you know, in our first cohort, you know, we 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 are we say we're sort of prop tech in the widest sense. We had smart point, which is you know, last mile distribution, net zero carbon. And we think that's very important from a sustainable perspective, very important to asset owners and users, right? But for a lot of people, you know, when they think of prop tech, they they don't imagine that. Um, so I think we do also, need, it's incumbent on ourselves to think more broadly when we look at the built environment and real estate. Um, so, so, you know, moving towards broader trends, um, and, and Alex, Ed, I'm going to jump to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to sound like a fanboy of JLL, how much I quote you guys, but with, with your decarbonizing the built environment report, it, you know, it was found that I think 18% of organizations have an action plan for the real estate portfolio, right? At the same time, the vast majority see value in implementing a sustainable strategy. So there, there is a disconnect between understanding the problem, understanding that there's value in solving the problem and yet actually solving it. And, you know, as a global provider of real estate investment management services, I mean, you guys, you know, JLL has a finger in every pie. So what role do you see JLL having in pushing sustainability ever more to the forefront of real estate and prop tech? And the other question, is that always going to be via the innovation department or the sustainability department? Or will we just reach the point where, look, no one, no one's carving it out. It just has become fully integrated into what it means to set up an asset, manage it, own it, operate it, sell it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, OK. Uh, good question. I think um, it's quite timely, actually, having this conversation yesterday. Um, and also, uh, from my own personal journey, I sort of 10 years of sustainability when it was like I say, you know, you were sort of considered a tree hugger and we didn't really want to talk to you. Um, and and now it's, you know, favorite person in the room. And then I went through a sort of similar journey, albeit started from a different place in terms of innovation and tech. Um, and it started in a much better place, I have to say. Um, but I think in terms of the journeys and how the, the sector has, has sort of matured in its understanding and, and certainly for like, for example, like JLL, um, our intent and, and indeed the way that we had to sort of start this typically was through a sort of fairly small you know club of people who kind of thought the same and felt the same and wanted to try and you know break down barriers and certainly this is true for sustainability um and and we were you know tr trying to sort of make a mark and it was it was a challenging few years to the point where and you know i think this is where jll you know deserves a lot of credit in terms of they acquired a consultancy that i was involved in and immediately it was like okay how do we take this skill set and this knowledge that you guys have outside of you know that consulting and apply it to capital you know capital markets transactions agency deals valuations you know property management it's a slow burn and i'm not in, in any way exaggerating that it's been easy or indeed that it's done um but the intent was to create a sort of internal team and then effectively push that knowledge down through into agents, valuers, et cetera. What we perhaps didn't do fast enough, and what we've certainly been doing quite a lot in the last 12 or 18 months for obvious reasons is, and we were actually seeing, and it's been quite interesting, seeing you know, valuers and agents and you know people that would haven't necessarily been through a sustainability professional kind of accreditation or training have come up and said, I want to be involved in this agenda um, and now we're now starting to see people within you know, existing sort of service lines take on more responsibility um, and actually now have and even some of them now have job titles of, you know, head of sustainability in agency or in capital markets or in property management. So, it, you know, there's been a, a journey over 10, 15 years of it and it started small. It grew as a sort of core 
the intent was and, the, and corporately very much sort of pushed but we're now seeing pull <laughs> um and so both from within teams and and the teams that perhaps you wouldn't have necessarily thought that would want to the obvious reason that they're pulling is because their clients are asking um and they recognize that this is a differentiator for them individually but also for us as a business um and so i think you know that's been generally the trend to the point where now it's probably the most talked about subject and it's if it's not number one on the agenda item it's number two for the c-suite so for that reason everybody now wants to be involved in the subject in the conversation i think with technology it's slightly different it kind of started at a point where it was seen as sexy and cool and we want to know about it um i think it, it's now getting to the point as as was mentioned by the others that those two things are aligning um and actually we're seeing i wouldn't say necessarily it's common, but we, it's getting to, it's getting more common that the conversation we'll be having with clients is how do we talk to you about technology and sustainability at the same time, rather than let's go and talk to you about technology and then we'll come back separately and talk to you about sustainability. And it's two very separate, you know, people and, and disciplines and skill sets starting. And this is a way to go. And I think both on the client side and on our side to integrate those conversations so that we can actually talk about, okay, in order to achieve your net zero carbon strategy for a portfolio or for a building, you will need, you know, design and, and you know, um, sort of supply chain support and, and skill sets. You will need valuation support. You will need leasing support, and you'll also need technology support. And here, here are our skill sets in that space. So, we are actively trying to build out a sort of sustainability team within the technology part of the business, and certainly for our VC fund sustainability is a big part of what their you know their investment thesis so we're trying to kind of cover off i guess all the different bases to ensure that we are bringing that skill set together and it isn't just through you know me or or the sustainability professional that actually anyone speaking to the client can at least go okay i know enough uh, of what i need to know and then i'll connect you in with the, with the right people so you know, that's how we're doing it we're obviously a big beast we've got lots of moving parts um, we're inefficient in many ways but the, the fact that we can we can mobilize that skill set um, and obviously looking to recruit. I mean, on that point alone, though, I would say everybody's looking to recruit, um, uh, you know, net zero or, or sustainability experts. So, um, you yeah, know, there's uh, a lot of people chasing salaries and also a, probably a, a lack of uh, skills. So that's certainly something for, um, for new you know people coming through grads and also perhaps some of the audience in terms of young tech people is really getting familiar with what are the standards what are the metrics what you know what what are the real estate decision makers actually looking to you know to procure based on what are that what are their metrics of success if you get to know that better then you've got a better chance of selling your product yeah thanks a lot no, I, I do think it is becoming more pervasive and i do think the gap is closing between sort of the technical knowledge that used to reside in the real estate owners and developers and the tech startups are now moving closer together hopefully and so so amy moving to you so you're obviously a co-founder of Amro Partners. I mean, what you said as well, you're in a very sustainability focused. You now are heading up on venture. So you have the benefit of both hats, right? In terms of not just the venture side, but also the asset owner perspective. So are there any trends that you're seeing? What trends are you seeing? Which ones are most interesting for you? And is that more from a user perspective or an investor perspective? Great. Uh, that's a great question, Paolo. Um, so just to give the audience a bit of background, uh, Amro Real Estate Partners, now called Amro Partners, to invest, develop and operate in the managed residential space. So we do student accommodation and multifamily. And we do that in the UK as well as in Europe. So it's a, it's a really super perspective. Many, many bits of the value chain are covered in our company. And then to add to the fun, I'm also doing some venture investing. So uh, why not, right? <laughs> so, um, so the the whole the, the question is a really good one because actually, what I'm seeing is a completely different analysis of risk as far as sustainability is concerned. So, ten years ago, it would have been a small part of the risk analysis, and it would have been somewhere somewhere in the cash flow, right, for for our, for our projects, and it, and it would be insignificant. What's happened is as those as that risk has uh, you know gone up and up in portfolios and at asset level, it's become obviously it's become the center conversation. Everybody wants to know what are you doing on ESG? What are your decarbonization pathways? Are you going to hit all your targets for in use and embodied, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and the question of 
the, the interesting thing and where venture comes in and I, and I have more fun doing this is the, there's always a big question who's paying for it right at the end of the day who's paying for all of this this is we want all this uh we want to obviously de-risk our portfolio from climate change but who's going to pay for it so if i if the answer is oh it'll be get, it'll get paid down the road because you have less rental voids uh yes that's one way of answering it and you know that that's a bit of a hypothesis if i mean there's more and more research that, that is the case but you know uh in in real time real conversations that that is a hypothesis and so then the question is what's the best way to achieve it clearly using tech solutions that actually save you some cost along the way make you smarter in how you approach the whole problem and de-risk giving you some kind of an ROI equivalent back so in fact what's happened is just like you said the conversation between and like just like alex also said the conversation between real estate and tech is starting to converge as far as analyzing the risk related to climate change is concerned and i think there's a fantastic opportunity to just work on that if you're a startup uh because you know that, that that's 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 really a great way to have start a conversation with the with the real estate side that's the big that's the one big trend i see and the other big trend is obviously everything is becoming ubiquitous with going on demand so you know we want a lifestyle that's on demand uh and a lifestyle that after after covid uh marries up with one's hybrid requirement really well so again i'm seeing a convergence of discussions between office suppliers and resi space mm -hmm. suppliers because there's this whole kind of convergence about working from home you know being ubiquitous with uh, remote working becoming part of life kind of thing and so how do we balance out the op opportunity for office owners and office landlords by providing their their staff who are our tenants uh, that that kind of a working you know co-working environment if you like in our, in our resi spaces so that's another convergence i see yeah. and again clearly the un underlying factor there is tech um so yeah uh, i thought i'd share those two with you for now awesome no that, that that's really helpful and i think i think the first just reminds me of you know pure externalities and spillover effects and economics on who closes the gap um, and you know, I think we'll touch upon it later with Bridget, where local government comes in and regulation comes in to drive to drive that gap. And I think from the second point, it's actually a great segue. So well done, because we're going to move to to Alex Evoked. And I know it's an area if you look at sort of co-living and working from home, I think is an area that you sort of cover. But Alex, would you? I want to touch upon you know you, you work at Eon, so you provide the infrastructure that powers the home. So so you know you have a real impact as to whether housing can, can become sustainable, right? I mean, without you guys, EV charging becomes harder, microgrids, everything around the home actually becomes a lot, lot more difficult. And I'm aware, I'm not going to give you the full quote, but the CEO of your networks division, Thomas Koenig, um, basically said, you know, uh, every digital Eon solution over the past few years was developed in partnership with other organizations from large tech organizations, research institutions and universities to startups. Um, I know you had the Eon Grid Startup Challenge last year. There was definitely Voixen, which is very prop tech in that portfolio. So I just want to ask how important is collaboration for driving change in the areas that you're focused on? And, and you know, for the startups in the who are now watching in the attendees, how do they collaborate with Eon? So, you know, who do they talk to and what are you looking for? Yeah, definitely it's a, it's a very important topic for us. And uh, like Amy said, with the convergence, we see the same thing uh, of the convergence again of energy uh, slash sustainability and buildings in real estate. And I think one, one big topic for us is that like, buildings become prosumers like smart connected uh, intelligent um, pieces instead in uh, in a smart city which can which do not only consume energy but also produce energy and the same applies for homeowners uh, which are um, which are producing energy and also have um, um, have the capability to save energy, for example, in e-mobility. And these are, of course, all topics which which we are looking at. And um, as you said, we don't do that on our own. We are, we are really in big corporations with universities, but also uh, want to highlight here the, the more like the startup and tech part. So we have the Future Energy Ventures at our venturing platform. And together with them, we are looking for innovative solutions, innovative startups, and also 
um, myself in the role as a startup partnerships manager, trying to make a match between the needs of the big corporate and the specific um, business units and the startups and um, trying to empower them to collaborate together because very often um, this is a big clash in cultures. So this is the, the one piece of the puzzle and we do that uh, with our startup partnerships team as kind of a hub in between these two worlds, but um, also a lot of um, um, topics are running on their own and maybe brought three uh, examples, which which I think um, show very well how, how this works. So one is, um, or maybe one step back, I think it's also important to have a look at it from a, in a more long-term perspective because um, what is now paying off, we started already five, six years ago. So one example is Gridex, it's a startup um, from our portfolio coming from the from the prop tech smart home space and was originally um, focusing a lot on, on smart home energy topics. And we um, invested already in 2016 into the company and just recently acquired them and, um, and kind of um, embedded them in our, uh, in our um, whole company, still working independently, but being the energy IoT provider for our company. So this is a really strategic uh, decision and they are now really helping us in various projects to, to improve smart charging uh, for bigger buildings and um, not only for smart home topics. So they have really evolved from this. And um, this has been only possible and also the acquisition has been only possible because we had several projects before together where we made proof points to the company that the collaboration did work. Um, another example is, uh, is Lemonbeat, which has been an incubation in 2015 already, uh, back then by Inogy. And uh, they are at the moment um, our provider for our Eon remote property management solution, where we, um, where we supply um, smaller residential buildings, which do not have a building management system in place with a retrofit solution to improve their energy management and then um, deploy energy savings by that. And uh, another example is an AI-based building management system double, which we invested in 2018. So um, where we are just, I would say in the beginning. So one message is really, it takes some time, but uh, if there's successful collaboration, which needs uh, really also um, interface management, it can really work out and become a, a great collaboration, I would say, between these three parties, energy, real estate, and uh, tech companies. Yes. Awesome, thank you. So, so, so talking about sort of the taking the long view, I suppose. Bridget, I just wanted to jump to you. So, you know, as mentioned at the beginning, UK, EU, well, pretty much most most countries now have taken pretty big commitments in terms of when they're going to hit net zero uh, to decarbonization as well. And from, from the governmental perspective, uh, in your role, which prop tech solutions are out there that may be a bit more off the beaten path that you find most exciting and think are going to be most impactful for the goals that you're trying to reach in your role? It's a big question. I'll try and answer it in a few minutes. I mean, I think just to go back a second to your uh, point, Alexander, around collaboration, it's just so critical. And I think we actually hosted uh, a session last week working with, uh, with the wider prop tech industry around sort of their challenges uh, to try and sort of sell their products into local government. And I think a, a big part of this is just being able to share learnings and see how we can collaborate and work together. Um, so I completely agree with your point around collaboration. But going back to your question, Paula, I mean, I obviously, sorry, can't speak for other government departments and that's probably above my pay grade, but I think it's really interesting to see, you know, the wider trends and certainly some of the startups in this space and certainly the ones that have been able to grow and scale quite rapidly. I think it's also important to recognize the pace of change so, I mean, Alex, you know, obviously you're both involved in the UK Prop Tech Association five years ago. I don't think that was a, was a, was a scare of what it is now. You know, there were no, there were no real conversations around Prop Tech. It was very, very early days. So as an industry, you know, the fact that we can have Prop Tech Awards, that we can celebrate uh, different case studies, I think is testament to the speed and scale of growth, at least in the UK, particularly supported by some interesting um, VC and funding models, but we still have a long way to go. So to answer your question, I think 
it's around what we can do in the industry to really support that adoption. And certainly where I sit, the digital engagement space is really interesting. In my previous role at Built ID, when we launched our community engagement product, uh, Give My View in March 2019, they were arguably one of only a very, very small number of companies in the digital citizen engagement, occupier engagement space. Fast forward two and a half years later, and there are now a number of players in the marketplace, as there should be. And we would hope that there are, you know, there is a much more developed prop tech ecosystem for all of the sort of emerging sectors and themes and needs and applications of technology. So we're currently working on our prop tech engagement fund at the ministry where we're actually working with local authorities to help them adopt prop tech into how they're um, developing their local plans and how they're engaging with communities. And that process is, is underway and we're working with 30 different local authorities across the country. And we hope that, that is the start of a much of a much bigger and broader uh, and opportunistic journey where we can help drive the acceleration of prop tech. And within that, the aspirations of what it could achieve. And I think that's really what I'd like to finish on is that I think we can, we can and we should aim higher for what prop tech can deliver. Um, you go into your point around linking in with other industries. Prop tech isn't just about where we sit in a building, whether we're eating there or working there or sleeping there. It's about our interaction with physical spaces in a variety of levels and interfaces. And I think as an industry, we should be much more open to opportunities that might not seem traditional prop tech, but actually could be could be wider around urban mobility, energy, transport, social services, healthcare, um, because it all has some level of direct or indirect relationship with real estate and with the community that uses it. I think that's a really interesting space to support. Yeah, I, and, and I, I fully agree on take, taking the broader view. And, and I'm going to jump to Alex Eds in a second. But before that, actually, just picking up on this, the prop tech engagement fund. So uh, I'm a startup. I've just heard that. I'm like, oh, this is great. How do I engage in now, later, how? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I suppose there's a question of, of what is your startup doing. So this this fund is focused purely on um, supporting the adoption of digital, digital citizen engagement tools yeah. that will help and uh, help the planning system become more accessible and more inclusive yeah. and just easier for people to but, engage with. Yeah, sorry, but in, in general, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but in general, yeah. you know, for, for startups, you know, depending on as you go through the different phases, is this just a case of going online? Is there a website they're meant to visit? Is it just ring up Bridget? Uh, you know, what, what's the, I, I suppose well, that's, that's not the answer. But... Yeah, that's why I had to do a plug, of course. But, you know, uh, we, we do have a website and I can share that with everyone attending here and, and post on LinkedIn. I, you know, I'll admit we're starting our journey and we want to, we want to engage with the industry yeah. uh, a lot more proactively. And I think it's also around challenging prop tech and startups expectation of what government working with government could achieve yeah. i'll be honest you know in a past life uh, government was one of many sectors that we would be targeting in terms of developing and scaling our products but actually government provides the greatest level of scale to really have influence and impact mm -hmm. and so i think we have to shift our perceptions on the prop tech side of actually working with government and what that could achieve probably in a medium to long term because it's been really yeah. interesting. I've only been in this role for a few weeks now, and the level of collaboration is amazing and, and super exciting, and particularly between different government departments as well. I think people are looking for case studies. They're looking for examples they can use because they know prop tech's here to stay, and they're just looking on how they can they can bring it in. So if anyone awesome. is watching today and is working on prop tech, please talk to me. That's my plug. <laughs> Yeah, watch the space, follow Bridget. Um, awesome. And actually, so, so jumping on that point, you know, uh, Alex adds to you. So we, we've heard from, you know, government, asset owners, investors, corporates. If you look at prop tech startups, I think it's quite easy to think, oh, you know, hey, I should target the government because they're big, you know, or I should go talk to JLL because they're big. Mm -hmm. Are they missing a trick? So are there other stakeholders in the real estate prop tech space? Um, that you see that are underserved, you know, and, and I'll say this from my experience, I think uh, facility managers are quite hard to get a hold of. They're quite underserved property managers. Again, they don't necessarily help themselves by making it easy. Um, but do, do you see other stakeholders that you think, look, actually for the prop tech startups, have you considered targeting these these verticals or, you know, stakeholders? Yeah, it's, it's a good question because actually the... Um... And there's a few ways of, of that it sort of rings a bell. And there's a few ways of answering this, but I think um, you know, sort of know your customer is, I suppose, the the kind of key thing here because mm -hmm. the amount of times, and less so now, but I would still say it's it's it happens. And um, but certainly in the early days, where companies would come in and pitch to us, you know, JLL, 
and obviously even JLL, right, is is a big beast. We've got people doing yeah. lots of things, and and we get a solution coming in and saying we, you know, we want to pitch to you. And I and I should say some of them came to us because their VCs pushed them to say you want to get JLL or CBRE on your on your ticket, and then we'll give you some more money, um, which is never great advice. So and and often often it would be look actually go away and test it with perhaps a smaller you know, um, you know, outfit that is willing to take a bit more of a risk because our risk appetite was, you know, not so tolerable. So there, there is an element of just, you know, where are you on your sort of product maturity and where where are you going to get the sort of buy-in and the kind of risk tolerance from, from your market to, to allow you to just, you know, prove the model? Because still a lot of solutions are not ready, uh, are not, are not sorry, are not necessarily ready, but they're not at the point where they're necessarily delivering the full value and they need to go through. And that's what innovation is all about. And I think, so certainly on the supply side, I think knowing your audience and to your point, even within organizations and even within a real estate company or within government or with, and certainly within government, but within real estate companies themselves is who is this product actually best aimed at? Yeah. And I think one of the biggest challenges I have, and this is kind of the hat that I wear a lot in terms of trying to marry up and when I when I spot a good solution is trying to introduce it internally is actually this would be really good for our planners. It would be really good for our strategy guys. It would be really good for our valuers. It would be re and so you end up having to sort of go around with each with this solution to each of them and say, look, this is the bit of that product that I think will add value to your to your job task. So that, that's that's the role of the innovation team or or equivalent, and I think that's a really big need, not in not only within a company but also within the industry. And our industry is so fragmented. And if you think yeah. about the supply chain of how you get a building built or operated from the beginning of you know where that material came from, there are so many intersections. And I think tech and data doesn't understand those barriers good um but they exist and we need to find a way of helping them through those pro you know, through those stages and so i think that's a you know within a corporation that's what the role of an innovation team or equivalent should be helping to do and have the yeah. have the power and the authority and indeed some you know some of the leverage to do that because often the people that you're trying to sell to don't necessarily get it but i think when you're talking about the industry as a whole there's a bigger challenge there. And actually, I don't think we have as an industry, and I talk from the UK's perspective, a good enough mechanism to help join those different, you know, uh, different sort of parts of the sector together um, to understand how solutions can kind of carry value through the supply chain. We just, we don't do it. That's not the way we think. That's not the way the industry has existed. And so I do think there's a big gap in the, in the market, you know, to say, to use that phrase in terms of, how do we bring the different stakeholders together to share benefit that will obviously then the, the sort of consequence of that is are there new ways of financing that are there new ways of selling that are there new ways of procuring that solution if it's going to ultimately drive value for more than one stakeholder because ultimately that's going to be the challenge from the commercial private sector is i'm only going to pay for what i'm going to get benefit of but this solution might actually benefit my 10 tenants the local community, the you know, the yeah. municipality, that is whatever. How how do we share that benefit? And ultimately, how is the company providing that solution going to get paid? Um, so I think there is a conundrum, certainly in the market. And I think there's, it's looking for a solution. It requires a wholesale change in the way that we go about buy, buying and procuring solutions. In companies, slightly easier, uh, but certainly the role of of, of roles like mine. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> shameless plug. That's exactly why we, we <laughs> exist. In fairness, Reach UK. If only there was a scale-up program like us. Um, <laughs> so actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm cognizant of time, but I really wanted to ask one last question for Amy, just because it's on the investment side. Um, and, and look, I'm, I'm aware there will be a lot of startups in the attendees who are undoubtedly asking themselves, you know, great, all this funding, money, how do I get it? Uh, Amy, you or you hold the keys to the vault. Let's be mm -hmm. let's be honest. Um, where does sustainability factor into your decision making process? You know, in, in a quick one, just is at the top of the funnel in the sense of look, actually, if you have a product that offers sustainable solutions or benefits in the sustainability space, great, you're getting an extra tick on the IC paper. Or is it just at the DD stage where you're like, look, I need to make sure that you know from an ESG perspective, I'm covered, or somewhere in between? Yeah, great, uh, good question, Paulo. So. Very, very simply, we have we are very thematic uh, in what we do, and we have a very clear mandate to invest in solutions, tech solutions that bring forward ESG. 
So it's very easy. If you have a sustainability climate tech, green tech solution, come talk to me. I'd be very interested. And if you have a solution focused on financial inclusion, come talk to me. I'd be very interested. It's literally those are my themes. So, but within that, let me you know give you an example of some you know of, of my experience. So I do find that because it is such a hot area, and I said I'd come back to the word hot, um, there are lots of solutions out there that are mimicking ESG. They're saying, mm -hmm. well, you know, we are ticking, and literally, you know, the, the screening process just takes that out, basically. Um, so there is that issue. If you really are, I mean, I'm going to ask you, so how much carbon do I remove using your solution? You know, let, let's, let's do the maths. Uh, so if you are happy to go along that route, uh, uh, along with me, I'd be really delighted to have the conversation with you because you are already one in like, you know, you're already one in 20 perhaps just by that factor. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, there's a whole lot of technology, climate tech, green tech, clean tech, some of it is infrastructure play. I would really recommend startups to really consider, be very customer centric. So going back to what Alex was saying, whose problem are you solving? And what problem exactly are you solving for that person? And what should, it, what should that person really be paying? in order to get that problem solved. So how big is that problem? What, you know, what element of the problem are you solving? We can all sit here and say that giving, giving, giving a customer, a real estate asset manager, ESG data is going to eventually do a wonderful amount of work for their ROI. But actually, if you're really customer centric, you're going to really think about which revenue stream is going to pay for this. So really get granular, I'd say, uh, in your thinking about you know, become really customer centric. And, and that's something I've learned from my time at Amber. The more customer centric you are, whatever business you're running, you know, you're more likely to have a really good win-win solution at the end of it. Fully, and with $17 billion agree. invested in climate tech in just in 2021, just, you know, what's happened yeah. already. I mean, you know, there's, there's no dearth of capital available. You fully agreed. And yeah. so just conscious of time, I know I wanted to give a bit more time for the audience. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Um, and I'm assuming that's going to be via the Q&A or chat function. If there isn't, I still have a bunch of questions outstanding. But if anyone does have a question, please feel free to ask. Uh, well, un until we get it and to avoid awkward silences, uh, <laughs> let, let's, uh, let's, let, me, let me add in one of the questions that I just wanted to ask, which was actually going um, for, for more of the sort of the um, user and local community aspect, and this one's both for Alex and, and Bridget, really, because I do like the fact that you are more focused on local communities. It's not, it's not a language I hear as often when I talk to tech startups. It's all very technical. It's all very sort of, you know, owner of the real estate asset focused. Um, but, you know, Alex, starting with, you know, Alex Vogt, that is, Alex, starting with you, you know, tenants account for 80% of the total energy consumption in buildings, right? Um, how do they answer the equation into what you're looking for, given that you supply the energy and, and what trends do you think they'll be driving that might have gone unnoticed thus far? Yeah, there, I think uh, it matches very well which, to what has been said earlier um, by the others, for example, by Bridget, that we have to bring community into the equation and the people, and also by, uh, by Amy, that there is big uh, change in the demand of uh, of how we live and work so putting up uh, like um the mix of the of our real estate from commercial to resi and so on and uh, we had a closer look at at that too and coming to the point that uh, you just said the tenants actually um have a big stake of what kind of energy is being used and this of course has a big impact on the su sustainability of of buildings and um and there we had uh, we had a closer look and we actually seen that uh, technology cannot solve this problem on its own so you need to come up with some solution which is um, which is also including the people and driving a behavioral change so what we did is we we had a look into the co-living sector and what we discovered is that they there it's even worse because people having a flat rate for their energy consumption so they don't even are not even accounted for um, heating, electricity, water usage. So um, our assumption is that there's even a bigger wastage of this. And uh, 
what did it test the kind of sustainability app using the community aspect and challenging the apartments against each other. So that means coming up with a leaderboard where people are being motivated to, to get on top by saving energy. And with that, we, we um, reduce for electricity consumption by 18%, which then brings a big impact to the payroll of the landlord or the building owner. So this is then really the financial impact. And bringing these elements together, I think is super important, but it's also like Alex um, Ed said earlier, it's also super difficult to um, in the current state of the industry to um, make it clear to whom are you addressing a proposition, for example, who is paying for it and who is having the benefits. And there, I think uh, we need to also find better solutions from an industry side, how to, how to um, uh, create these added values and share these added values. But it is really true that it's super powerful to include the, the tenants into this equation. And I think this will be also elementary for the future to, um, to come up with tech solutions, combine it with uh, changing the behavior of the people living and working in buildings. And by that, having a cost impact, a cost reduction to the landlords and um, housing owners. Awesome. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm aware we have two, three minutes. I think, Bridget, I might have to jump you. <laughs> That's OK. Um, I, I just wanted to say, because I think we need to get Valter back on. Um, so just before I did, I just want to say a massive thank you for, to, to the panelists for taking the time uh, to come on and, and share their insights. And I think um, it's been absolutely wonderful to get that insight from so many different aspects of the market. So I'm, I'm really, really honored to have been here on you. And obviously, again, thanks so much for the team at Global PropTech Online for hosting it. Um, with that said, I think I'm going to nicely ask the panelists to go backstage so that Valter can join, if that's OK. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Fantastic. everybody. Thank you so much. All the best. Thanks.